We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6. As you turn there, uh, we're continuing in storyline, as Dan said. We're just kind of covering some of the highlights of the Bible and hoping that you guys are reading through this throughout the week. As always, if you're behind, if you haven't ever started, just start now. Start this week. Check out our website. It'll tell you where we're reading this week, and we'd love for you just to join in. It's awesome to have believers who are intelligent about the Word, who are informed about who God is and how He has chosen to illuminate Himself to us through His Word, and so it's just the best when God's people engage in his word. And so let's pray real quick. Lord, we do thank you for uh, this book, this library of books, Lord God, that were written on different continents and from people who spoke different languages and people uh, with just such different lives. And yet your story throughout uh, creation to the very end of this world as we know it uh, has been one of love, one of pursuit towards humans. And uh, it's also been a story of how Uh, good we are at messing up your greatness. And so as we learn today about worship and how easy it is to mess that up, I pray that your spirit would help me to speak accurately and clearly and passionately and creatively. And I pray that we as your people would be submitted to you through your word, Lord God, that we wouldn't need to just be spoon fed, but that we would be discerners of your word, that we would grow in it, that we would become mature in it. And we thank you that this is possible through your spirit alive within us. We thank you that your presence is here as you have promised, where two or three gather in your name, there you are. And so thank you that you are here. We recognize your presence. We celebrate your work in our life, and we ask that you would help us to perpetuate your work in this world this week. And we love you. Amen. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm just going to read through it, and then we're going to dig in. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called The Name, the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart, and they brought it out from the house of Abinadab, which is on a hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, they drove that new cart. And they brought it out of the... um, Did I just read that? No, he just repeats himself. Verse 4, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of firwood, on harps and stringed instruments, on tambourines and sistrums and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God to hold it, for the oxen had stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his heir, and he died by the ark of God. And David became very angry, or David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Now when it was told to King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and he brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was. When those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he, David, sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord, and they set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Now when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both women and men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. Nothing says worship like a cake of raisins. Amen? You guys said amen, and you've never actually done that. You don't even know what a raisin cake looks like. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself in the eyes of all the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. 
See, now you have biblical proof, like there's sarcasm in the Bible. You can use sarcasm, right? Like it's right there. Verse 21, then David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Isn't that kind of like a stereotypical, fairly obscure, semi-wacky New Testament or Old Testament chapter? I love it. It is so weird. Uh, I've been excited to talk about this for, for some time now. And I don't know how familiar you have been with the story. Maybe this is just the first take for you. But the very first time I heard the story, I was a kid at camp in McCall, Idaho. And my friend Kurt um, had, was way more intelligent than I was and had read the story. And we were in our cabins, lights out, talking like weird kids do. And for some reason, we're actually talking about the Bible, which is pretty spectacular for junior high boys. Um, and Kurt just said, I just read the story about this guy named Uzzah or Uzzah, and God killed him because he was trying to help out God. And Kurt struggled with this. And in fact, he he just flat out said, I can't worship a God who does that. How how can we say God's good if he's gonna do this sort of thing? And literally from that day on, Kurt has never been a Jesus follower or God worshiper, and he used this text as his proof text to say, God's not good, God's not loving, God's angry and wrathful and overreacts, therefore I will not follow him. And so I'm excited to talk about this because this is truly a chapter about worship. We can learn so much. And so let's jump back in and just uh, start from verse 1. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel. So we're in Samuel. Originally it was called the Book of Kings, but now we have First and Second Kings, so they couldn't call that. So then they called it the Book of the Kingdoms, and they didn't have book, and books like we do. They just had like parchment and stones and stuff. So they had to split it into two separate categories because it was just too long to fit on one particular writing. So they broke it into first and second, and they just happened to call it Samuel because Samuel's kind of the guy who kicks off the storyline. It was written by a few different people. And what it is, is this this culmination of Israel, that they've gone into the promised land. They've had their time of the judges. They're not doing well at all. And finally, they demand a king. So God sends them towards Saul. Saul is this tall guy. He's a handsome guy. He's a strong guy. He's who we would automatically assume would be a great leader just by his physical stature. Saul is given every chance, as all of us are, to obey God and to worship God. And time after time, Saul is really flippant and irreverent with how he responds to the Lord and how he chooses to worship the Lord. And again and again, he's given opportunity. And again and again, we see Saul just totally blunder and absolutely mess up how he should be leading and how he ought to be worshiping the Lord or obeying God. And time after time, he just refuses. And we see that this guy is way more concerned with how he looks in the presence of his people than he is concerned at the condition of his heart before the Lord. He's way more concerned about his image and his persona than he is about obeying the commands of God that he is supposedly king over this God's people. And so he comes to a pretty terrific end, a pretty horrific end, rather, we should say. And this young champ of his, this uh, warrior, David, is suddenly anointed king and assumes power. So David has assumed power. He has uh, brought Israel and Judah together. There's this one unified nation. These are the glory days of Israel. They finally have a king. They're finally this nation. They can see this leader. David is this incredible guy who does love the Lord. He's this incredible warrior. He's given great victory. David finally marches on the city of Jerusalem, which until this day, hundreds of years after Israel began to occupy the promised land, is still held by the Canaanites. It's this enemy stronghold, and David is finally the victor who overpowers and defeats the city makes it his capital, and just by mere coincidence, I'm sure, accidentally named it the city of David. Like, things are great for David. He has finally got Saul out of the picture. He's got wives. He's, he's got armies. He's getting riches. He's got a new capital. The whole nation's following him. He's God's chosen dude to lead God's people on earth. Like, things are great. City of David, why not? Well, there's something missing. There's this Ark of the Covenant. He wants to bring it back. He wants to bring this visible representation of the presence of God into his city. And this is the whole story. 
Verse 1, again David gathered all the choice men, or all the young or valiant men of Israel, 30,000. David's not taking any chances. There's still Philistines. There's still remnants of the Canaanites in this land. And David wants to make sure that what he's about to do with this ark is well protected and secure, so he just musters the troops of 30,000. And David arose, and he went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God. This is a stereotypical Old Testament thing. What, what is the ark of God? Well, I'm so glad I asked. In Exodus 25, God is giving the law, and God is telling people how they can approach God. God is sort of laying out his expectations for humankind and what is proper and improper conduct, what is appropriate and inappropriate worship, and how these people, God's people, are to be set apart and live obedient lives unto him. During the impartation of this law, God talks about he wants this tabernacle or, or a temple, if you will. Uh, it's called a tabernacle because it can be relocated. It's more of a tent than anything. And there's different stages to this place of worship. And the best or most holy part we'll call the Holy of Holies. And in the middle of that, God gave directions to build a wooden box that he's going to call the ark. And it's roughly four foot long by two foot high and two foot deep. And this box is to be made out of acacia wood and it's to be covered in gold. And God says, make a special lid for this thing. The lid obviously is, is the same dimensions, four by two. And upon this lid, I would want you to make, God says, these two cherubim or the image of two angels facing one another. So on either side of the lid, imagine two angels. I know you've all seen angels, so you know what they look like. And have the angels facing the center of this lid and their, their wings out as if they were protecting it or ensconcing this particular area. And God says, I will choose to make my presence dwell in between these two cherubim. And not only that, but God says that that place, this hollowed area between the cherubim and their outspread wings is to be called something that's a mercy seat. I don't know. But what God does say is that though he created all created things, though the universe itself and its expanse cannot contain our God, God, for whatever reason, has chosen to make this little ark, this golden covered wooden box, he's chosen to make that the place where his presence dwells here on earth. Imagine it somewhat as like the throne of God here on earth. It's, it's kind of a big deal because God's kind of a big deal. So God lays out how to build this and how to approach it and where to put it in the tabernacle. And only the priests can go in the tabernacle. And there's one special priest we'll call the high priest. And only he can go into this holy of holies. And even then he can only come in once a day and touch the thing in a particular ceremonial of appropriate way. There was a lot of pomp, there was a lot of circumstance to this, and God was trying to impute among, among his people the sense of awe, uh, 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 to conjure up these emotions of reverence. Like, this isn't just some piece of furniture, and isn't it neat, it's gold, but like, this is the presence of the living God, and he has chosen to bless us with his presence here in his holy temple upon the ark. A neat thing about the ark is it had two, uh, four rings, two on either side. They were also gold. There's a lot of gold in this Holy of Holies. And it had wooden poles that went through there that they were also covered with gold, and it was to be carried. And as God continues to develop this law, God says only the priests can get in there, and only the high priest can touch it, and only the priests can carry it to not just any priests, but these particular dudes from a clan called the clan of Kohath. And they have to carry these sticks upon their shoulders to uh, be the symbol of close relationship that they are literally bearing God and, and carrying this thing along. Like, don't, don't carry this any other way. And when you do, you need to cover it. And there's a lot of awe and reverence as part of this God worship. God was very specific. And he said, if anyone were to presumptively or irreverently come and do something bad or less than pure worship to this Ark of the Covenant, if someone touches it beyond what they ought to do, I will, I will kill them. I will strike them dead. Because this is the presence of a pure, just, righteous, sinless being, an eternal being who's living here. And if any human in any inappropriate fashion would presume to be an equal with God, that they could just handle the Ark of the Covenant as if it were no big deal. I will strike them down because God is God and, and we are clearly not. And so God clearly delineates that this Ark is like the pinnacle of the holy things among this holy God worship, among his holy people on this earth that he has created. The author here in 2 Samuel is wanting to help us remember the weight of this particular thing. And so he says, they brought up the Ark of God 
whose name is called the name. He's invoking that Yahweh name that was, was so profound, it was so holy that the Hebrews wouldn't even utter it out loud. And so they just say the name. This isn't just an ark. This is the ark of the God with the name. He's the Lord of hosts. He commands heaven's armies who dwells between the cherubim. And the author here in 2 Samuel 6 is really wanting us to make sure we understand in full the gravity of this particular object. This isn't just a really neat piece of furniture. This isn't some archaic religious artifact of the God back in the desert. This is where his presence dwells. This is not flippant. This is not just, oh, that's neat. Like, this is a big deal. This has weight to it. So they set the ark of God on a new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. The ark has had a really interesting history up until this point. So the ark of God was, was built and created, and the priests conducted themselves in an obedient manner according to the ascription of the Lord, and things were great, and then the people assumed the new land, and then things started going weird. The people of Israel did what was right in their own eyes, it is said in multiple times in Judges. They're rebellious, they are compromising, they are lazy and apathetic, they do not drive out these sinful people, but instead they cohabitate with them. Instead of pure, righteous, unadulterated God worship, suddenly the gods of these Canaanites are looking pretty interesting, like pretty decent other options. And their worship kind of appeals to the appetites of these Israelites. And so they start worshiping other gods alongside of God. And suddenly they just start worshiping other gods that eclipse God's worship. And that's where we find ourselves. And so when these people demand a king, uh, first of all, um, God says, they're not rejecting the priests or, or any leadership. They're rejecting me. Like, these people don't want me as their king and their ruler. They just want some physical, um, personal thing that they can see and worship, such as a male being their king. So things aren't going well, and the ark of God is sort of lost in the shuffle. And what we see in the beginning of 1 Samuel is Israel decides to go to war against the Philistines. For whatever reason, they're just tired of cohabitating with their enemy, and they're finally going to do something about it. They go out, they march against the Philistines, they're vastly outnumbered. 4,000 Israelites are killed that day in battle. So they retreat, they draw back, they're a little bewildered. We're the people of God. Like, we're supposed to win everything. Like, we're blessed. Why is this happening? I know what we need to do. We need to get the ark, and then we'll be invincible. So they go, and they grab the ark, and they bring it out. Forget God worship. Forget consulting God if this is a good idea. Forget about obedience or purifying themselves for his presence. They just get this thing that seems to be a religious relic that they feel will make them invincible. They take the ark out to battle. They're going to beat the Philistines this time. And they shout, and they're, they're full of bravado, and they feel like they're going to win, and 40,000 of them this time are massacred. The Philistines just rout them, and they steal the Ark of the Covenant. Hey, hey, this is their religious symbol. This is the pinnacle of their worship. This is a sign of their strength, and we've got it. Aren't the Philistines awesome? So the Philistines, they go and they put it in one of the temples of their false gods, and things do not go well. Things start falling apart, and the people start getting sick, and this plague starts spreading, and the Philistines in the particular areas start just sending this Ark of the Covenant to different little sub-capitals of the Philistine kingdom. And everywhere the Ark of the Covenant goes, among the enemies of God's people, they all get sick, they start dying, funky things start happening, and they finally convene the order of their religious sect to figure out what do we do with this. Nobody wants it, we're all getting sick, many of us are dying, funky things are happening, how do we get rid of this? They consult their false prophets, they consult their diviners, and these people who do not worship God, who do not know his law, who do not know what he's commanded, they say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the ark of God on a brand new cart. We're going to hitch it up to a couple cows who don't know any better, and we're just going to let them go. And if they wander back to Israel, we'll know it was God and that he really was punishing us, and it's just not this mere coincidence. They do that. They put some weird gold things on the ark too, like golden tumors and rats. Isn't that fun? I got a golden rat. And um, I'm just really, I don't know, it's weird. And lo and behold, the cows go back to Israel. Israel receives this thing, and they, they're rejoiceful, they're emotional, things are great, we got the Ark of the Covenant back, but they take it in a flippant manner again. In fact, the town that the Ark arrives at with these two particular cows, they, they just think to themselves, no one's around. There's no prophets, there's no high priest, no one's going to uphold the law. Let's look inside. What is in this box? This thing, this golden thing, like how cool is it? How many hundreds of years old is it now? And what is in here? 
Well, we know by Scripture that God commanded that the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments were placed in there, the second set, obviously. We know that God commanded that a jar of the manna which fed his people in the desert times, it was also placed in there. And we also know that God had asked that Aaron's rod that budded as a sign of God blessing Aaron as leader, that that also was placed within the Ark of the Covenant. And so these people want to see what's inside. Forget the presence of God. Forget awe. Forget reverence. Forget the fear of the almighty living Lord of hosts. I just want to see what's inside the cool gold box. So they take off the lid, they look inside, and a lot of people die that day because they had directly disobeyed. They had flippantly uh, treated the presence of the living God. And because of that, people are fearful, and they just stick it in this house that is referenced here in 2 Samuel 6. So the Ark of the Covenant has been in the house of Abinadab for some time. We don't really know. The scriptures say it was there for 20 years, and then Israel demanded a king, It was Saul. Acts tells us that Saul reigned for 40 years. After Saul was deposed, David becomes king. People think David might have been king anywhere from like 1 to 12 years at this point. So the ark's been largely forgotten about for literally decades, somewhere between 20 and 70 plus years. It's just kind of rotted in this obscure house up on a hill somewhere in the nether reaches of Jerusalem until David comes and brings it back. David wants to bring it into the temple. David wants to bring it into the capital. David wants to make God worship at the center of Israel. And all of that is admirable, and it's very sincere. And when David does so, it looks great, right? They bring up the ark of the Lord, who is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. They set the ark of God on a new cart, and they bring it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, they drove the new cart. And they brought it out from the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. We really need you to know it was on a hill. Accompanying the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. And it sounds great, does it not? David and all the house of Israel, they played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of firwood, on harps and stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And at first blush, this is an incredible worship scene. And there's some scenes in the New Old Testament I don't want to be a part of. But it would be fun to be a first-person witness of this particular endeavor. This is the glory days of Israel. This is where it starts getting good. They've got a king. He's after God's own heart, as God himself has described. He's bringing the ark back. We have tens of thousands of God's people worshiping God. We have the very ark and presence of the Lord God Almighty in their midst. And there's just this beautiful symphony of praise that I'm sure could be heard for miles as the whole nation gathered up instruments and sang with their voices. It's got all the hallmarks of a very successful worship service. Great leader, huge numbers, awesome worship, supposedly the presence of God. Who wouldn't want this to be the characteristics of our praise? And yet the author has inserted very subversively a few little hints to help us know that things are not as good as they seem. First of all, Scripture tells us that this ark of God, this home of um, Abinadab, was in a place called kirath Jerem just a Hebrew name, which means a city of forests. It's up in this hill country. There there used to be beautiful forests, and that's what the city was known for because you just pretty much named cities after whatever was around at the time. But the author here has ascribed a different name to this particular city, and in verse 2, he says, the name of the city at this current time was known as Baal Judah, which literally translated as the city of worship of Baal in Judah. And so we see God's people who are supposedly God's worshipers with the Ark of the Covenant in the city, and instead of it being known for God and his presence and his Ark, what it's really famous for is this is the center of Baal worship for all of Judah. And Baal is this Canaanite god, and he's the son of El, and he's the son of Ashereth, and he's kind of like this fertility god, and his worship is pretty messed up, very sinful, has nothing to do with Yahweh of the Old Testament, and yet this is who they're worshiping. This is what this area is famous for, the center of worship for Baal instead of the worship of the Lord. That's, that's number one warning sign. Number two, whether it was out of ignorance, maybe it was pride, maybe it was just flat out disobedience, we will never know. But here's how David chooses to move the cart. He put it, as it says in verse three, he chooses to move the ark by putting it on a new cart. Now that's funky because they have the law. They are told to read this law every year at least as a, an assembly or congregation They should know this law inside and out. They should have most of it memorized. They're supposed to literally write it on their doorposts and like memorize it in their brain. And here they're directly disobeying it because they're putting the ark of God on a new cart. 
They're worshiping God the way the Philistines did it. They're just taking their worship cues from the world instead of from what God has told them in his law. And so we start to see a few different little cracks in the foundation of a supposedly great worship service. Are the people emotionally invested? Absolutely. Are they sincere? It sure looks like it. Are they all there? Yeah. But things start going wrong in verse 6. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark of God and take hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And at first glance, so many of us would think, the dude's trying to do God a favor, and God just smites him? Stereotypical Old Testament. Like, this is God worship, and God ought to be there because his presence is above the ark on this mercy seat, and the God of this mercy seat strikes someone dead? Like, he kills this worship service literally by striking one of the priests dead. How is this a good God? How is this a loving God? How is that compatible with the rest of what this New Testament stuff through Jesus tells us about God? Perhaps you respond that way. Perhaps you're like my friend Kurt who, who just finds this unbelievable and walk away. But as we begin to look, these people are engaging God on their own terms. At the very least, they are so utterly flippant with this presence of the Lord. Though they have the counsel of God that we call the Old Testament, particularly the law, in their midst, though they are commanded to learn it, this is the one distinguishing mark between Israel and the rest of the world. This is how they know God. And they are choosing to ignore it. And living in ignorance doesn't seem to keep them happy here. Because God strikes out. The anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error. That can also be translated as irreverence. And he died by the ark of the Lord. Verse 8 is interesting. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah, which is literally translated as God's outbreak against Uzzah. And he calls it that to this day. That's fascinating. I am so intrigued by this passage because we see that it is possible to ascribe worship to God in ways that are absolutely counterfeit. This passage shows us that even if we're emotionally invested, that doesn't make it all right with God. Even if we're just a bit flippant, God isn't pleased that we're just making some sort of half-hearted attempt. What we see here is a God who keeps his promises. He, he had commanded that they not touch it. He had prescribed ways that they do it. He had provided whole clans of people who were appropriate to carry this Ark of the Covenant. And what does Israel do? They abandon God. They ignore his Ark. They do not set up the tabernacle for generations. When they do gather the sin, it seems to be more of a prideful thing that David's bringing the Ark into the city of David. They, they are uninformed. They take cues from the Philistines instead of from the law, which sets them apart from the whole world. And it's so easy to cast stones against these Israelites, but Anthem, how often do we approach God on our own terms? Uh, this is how I please God. This is what, quote unquote, works for me. I'll believe what I believe. It's right for me, and you believe what you want. It's right for you, and we'll get to God somehow. And we just assume, we presume that we understand how to please God. Or that if we make some sort of attempt, God has to accept it because we were sincere in it. Or we come to worship because we feel this emotional high and there's a lot of people and we have strong leaders and things are clearly successful because we have all of those things. And what we see here is that worship is often so different from what we think it should be. What we see here, worship isn't always the easiest. It's not always the most fun. Worship generally is not what the world endorses. Worship sometimes isn't even what we see the church doing at large in our world today. And David responds in a fascinating way. Verse 8, God became, oh wow, that was weird. David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak. David is indignant. God, you just embarrassed me in front of my people. I was going to bring you into my town. You are going to be part of the capital. We were going to uh, amalg amalgamate you back into worship here, and you just ruined it. You killed this worship service. This was all for you, and now I look like an utter fool. Like, can you imagine, as being leader of these people, that you're suddenly now responsible for a super awkward moment and the death of this Uzzah character? Like, what, what was going through his mind? God, I was sincere. God, I was engaged in worship. God, I was emotionally invested. God, I was doing this stuff for you. Forget that I was doing it wrong. At least I was doing it. And how often do we today just get so mad at God when he doesn't do what we want him to? 
We write off God when his timetable doesn't match what we've told him he has to do. That we'll worship God as long as we feel good, as long as it's fun, as long as it doesn't cost us anything, as long as we don't have to submit to his way of approaching him and his terms of worship. But when that confronts with what we just like and prefer, then we walk away. We'll try a different church. We'll dabble in a different religion. We'll just check out and coast for a while. And that's what we see David's predecessor, Saul, doing. That is why he was deposed. Is that time after time, he came to God on his own terms. Time after time, he was about his pride, what made himself look good. He was more worried about his image than what God had commanded him to do. And though extension after extension was given to Saul to try again, Again and again, we see Saul walking in his own ways, refusing to submit to the way God had told him to obey and to worship. And what we see here in 2 Samuel 6, 8 is that David right now has this opportunity to follow in the footpath of Saul. Presumptive king, a little bit ignorant, makes a mistake. Consequences happen. How will he respond to this? So many of us get stuck in this angry spot. The church, the church isn't the power of God because they didn't treat me the way I should have been treated. They were unfair. God's clearly unloving because he, he allowed sickness and heartache into my life. I wouldn't worship God because it's, it's just not easy for me. That's not how I, that's not how I do it. I don't want to sing in, in a group of people. And it's fascinating that we put all these terms and conditions on God and what he has to do and what he has to bend in order for our worship to be okay. Like, it's flat-out disgusting, Anthem, to hear comments such as, the music's too quiet. I, I hate it when I hear my, my, my own voice sing. You, you hate hearing yourself worship the living God? The, the music's too loud. No one can worship with that rock music. I hate it when this instrument's on there. I would prefer that particular worship leader not be here, and when they're here, I'll just chat for another 20 minutes out in the foyer. I hate it when it's hot in here. I can't worship at all. Oh, when it's cold at church, I'd rather just leave because I get really uncomfortable. We hate it when they don't sing the newest songs. We get frustrated when they don't sing the old hymns. We get frustrated when they sing a different version of the song and they put that one line in that's a little bit awkward. And we have all of these terms and conditions upon our worship of the living God. And what David here is learning is when you're trying to, quote unquote, worship God on your own terms, it is unacceptable. And in fact, I would go so far as saying that is what all false religion is. I don't care if you're an uninformed David. I don't care if you're a Muslim. I don't care if you're a Buddhist monk. It doesn't matter. You're trying to approach God on your own terms, with your own timeline, and it is unacceptable to him. And what we see here is Uzzah pays the ultimate price for his presumption. And that's another dynamic as well. Uzzah has grown up in this house of Abinadab. Like the ark has literally been in his house all of his life. He is so overly familiar with it that there's no respect, there's no awe. He's lost that idea of wonder of the presence of God, and and suddenly it's up to Uzzah to protect God from this little ark falling on the ground. How many of us approach God that way? Oh, another Sunday, another two hours I get to lose until I can finally have fun this afternoon. A few more worship songs. They probably won't fit the bill for me. Another 45 minutes of a boring sermon. We can plow through this and finally get on to the good parts of the day. I love to go to the early service because then I can get on with with my day. Have we lost our fear of God? Do you come to church recognizing that God has promised he's here? That it's not a building that's a church, that we are the church, that the power of the living God is in our midst. And most often we come here unprepared and flippant and irreverent, and we care way more about our clothes and our hair than we do about the condition of our heart. How often do we come here and just try to get an emotional high, and we'll lift our hands, and we'll do all the things, but our hearts are so far from God today and the rest of the week? How often do we belittle our Lord by absolutely pathetic hearts while we worship him, that we have so narrowly defined worship. Got to be these songs at this time with these people in this key. I hate it when those dudes sing too high. I can't follow them. And then I can worship. But the rest of my life, well, that's mine. Man, this is convicting. And David's angry. Verse 9 This is what sets David apart. This is why David is the king of kings among Israel until Jesus will finally assume his throne is because David had a heart after God. 
David did not dwell in the badlands of anger and rejecting God, but David understood suddenly that he is in the presence of someone so much greater than himself. And it says that David feared the Lord that day. I tell you, Anthem, we need some more fear of God in our lives. God is not your homeboy. He's not a pathetic puppy dog that will do whatever you want him to do just so you like him. He's not some genie that you get to command, do this for me, do that for me, get that out of my life. I want to look like this and to be like that and to experience these things. And if, and if I can't have that, then you're not real and you're not loving and your church sucks. And David begins to fear the Lord. And in Proverbs and in Psalms, it says the fear of the Lord is actually the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. When we start to recognize that God is, is not our peer, that we are not equals, that he is the Lord of hosts, that he is Yahweh who created everything that is created, and how dare we treat him as if he were nothing but the best among all things. And so David fears the Lord that day, and this is the beginning of an incredible king. This is the beginning of a fruitful life with God. If we will begin to understand we can't be flippant, we can't be disrespectful, we don't set the terms and conditions of God and his worship and how to please him, he has done that already. Thank you very much. And so David says, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? I am so unworthy. How can this thing cohabit the city that I dwell in? It, it can't be. I've, I've messed this up. I've screwed this up. This is the Lord that I was dealing with, and I didn't even recognize it. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Fascinatingly enough, this Gittite is from the tribe of Kohath. David has finally put this ark under the appropriate care with qualified individuals who can actually obey the Lord's ordinances for worship and for the movement of this ark. And once more, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Don't forget don't miss this, the author is saying in redundancy. He's put it in the right hands, and it stayed there for three months. And God's not just burning with anger. God's not spreading plagues as he did with the Philistines those decades before. It says this, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. That God wants us to come to him, but on his terms. That God delights in blessing his people, and God longs for intimacy in relationships if we will humble ourselves, and if we will approach him with the appropriate context of our heart. And it was told to David, saying, the Lord has blessed his house, the house of Obed-Edom, and all that belongs to him, because the ark of God is there. David correctly takes this as a good sign. David spent three months in isolation. We don't know what's happening. Clearly, he has taken some time to study. Obviously, there's fear of the Lord. There will be obvious submission as we see him with appropriate, informed worship in this scene to come. And so after three months, it says, David went up and he brought the ark of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. This isn't just some superficial emotional response that we saw the first time. This isn't an ignorant but sincere, albeit sincerely wrong, attempt to please God. This is David who understands now through God's word how to approach God and how appropriate God worship takes place. And now David is worshiping with gladness. Verse 13, and so it was when those who were bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. So David's obedient. The Kohath dudes, they're carrying the ark as prescribed by the Lord. And every six paces, they stop. And David walks in front of them, step number seven, and he makes a costly sacrifice. He sacrifices a bull or an oxen and a fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord his God with all his might. Where at first he was singing, there was worship, and it was there. Now we see David doing something that Jesus prescribed as the, the great commandment of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And David's doing that, and he's singing, and he's dancing, and all that David is is invested into this God worship. It's not some great duty that the king of Israel is performing. It's not this pride show of David, the leader of God's people, bringing God back into the city of David. This is just a soul with all that it is worshiping its maker. And so David dances with the Lord with all his might. And as a footnote, David was wearing a linen ephod. David has stripped himself of all that adorned him as king. David has removed the visible objects that would identify him as king, and he has set them aside because they inhibited his worship. What a profound symbol here. David isn't clinging to his pride. David isn't coming before the Lord saying, what an asset I am to you, God. Use me. David is saying, I don't care about that. That actually inhibits my worship. I'm, I'm just going to strip down to whatever this ephod thing is, and I'm going to worship you like that. 
just as a commoner, just as one soul worshiping its Lord. What a beautiful picture. What a changed man we see here. So David and all the house of Israel, they bring up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Verse 16 is fascinating. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Here, when Michael is referenced, every time, actually, she's referenced, she's linked to Saul. She's a daughter of Saul. Saul hated David because David became more popular and more successful. Saul, being a guy that's all about image and persona, couldn't deal with that. Like, his life was based on being the best and the strongest and the king and the powerful. And so when David usurps him through popularity, Saul tries killing him. Like, Saul tried killing him twice with a spear in his own home, and David flees. And then Saul comes up with this idea, I'm going to give David my daughter in marriage, because then he'll, his proximity be, will be around me, and I can kill him. Great idea. Until he finally, at the last minute, gave that daughter to someone else to marry, and spited David. And then he said, my, my youngest daughter, what about her? He found out this do- youngest daughter, Michael, loved David. She was smitten by him. He was the hero and a warrior. And so he says, I'm going to give her to David. And she's going to trip him up, and hopefully we or the Philistines can kill him. So David marries her. So dudes, if you were ever dating a girl, and her dad literally tries killing you a few times, and then says it's okay to marry her, don't, okay? Just don't. But David does, and um, and this Michael lady is is the product of of this liaison. And so when she looks out the window, she despises David because she's continuing, she's perpetuating this mindset of Saul and his household. It doesn't matter if your worship is impure. It doesn't matter if you're disobedient. You just need to look good. Dress nice, act the part, just live for this world, make sure people like you. In fact, you need to be more careful that people like you than you're careful that God is pleased with you. And Michael continues to perpetuate this. And when she sees David, who has removed the objects of his royalty, who is dancing like a fool before the Lord, who is half naked and sweaty and exuberant and whirling like the women danced, she despises him because that's not what you do. That's not how you look good. That's, that's not how you become popular and influence people. Like her heart had nothing to do with God. Who cares that this procession was coming? Forget about the presence of God dwelling in this capital city. There was so much to worship for. There was so much reason to celebrate, and she wrote all of it off. We just need to look good, act the part. Do you ever feel that way when you come to church? Morning's rough, you fight with the family, but you walk in and your shirt's buttoned and your hair's did, and man, you look good, and you can put on a good facade for a while, but, but do you think that's really what matters? Ultimately, do you really think that that is what matters? And so she despises him. But David brings the ark of the Lord. He sets it in the midst of the tabernacle, and he offers burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings among all the people, and notice the language that this author is using to try to get us to understand how comprehensive these gifts were. It says, uh, when he was finished, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of the hosts. He offered burnt offerings. He blessed the people. I totally lost my spot. Sorry, hold on. Oh, he distributed among all the people, the whole multitude, yes, both the women and the men. He gave to all of them a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins that you lied about earlier. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. And what we see here initially is that worship, incorrect, impure, wrong, unacceptable worship was about David. It's about who he was. It's about what he was doing. And it was wrong. It was It was impure, it was downright disobedient according to the law of God. What we see was about them. They took cues from the world, they didn't understand. But what we see about this pure, acceptable worship now that David has had this heart change is it's full of humility. It is empowered by the fear of the Lord. It is informed through the counsel that God has given them. And what we see here is it's not about David's lists of demands, it's about the Lord and it's about inviting others into this worship. David's not saying, we only have the trumpet this time. When I did things, we had, we had cymbals and sistrums and we had lyres and harps. We, we did it, way, it sounded way better than this. David's not concerned about what he wants, about his little niche market for worship. What David is saying is, this is all about God and I want everyone to join in. Everyone, everybody gets a cake and every, everybody gets these, these other pieces of meat and the bread and David wants people to join in. In verse 20, when David returned to bless his house, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David, and she said, How glorious was the king of Israel today! 
uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base or perverted fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. She, she cares not about God. She decides not to engage in worship. Instead, she derides David because David isn't acting the part. He's not, he's not behaving in the way that is proper. And this, this idea is perpetuated on in the New Testament through the Pharisees, right? They act the part. They know scripture. They supposedly obey. But Jesus says, you're dead. Yeah, you look great on the outside, but inside you're rotting corpses. And this is exactly what Michael is doing here. And with cutting sarcasm, she tries to undermine all of the identity and worship and pleasure and praise that is filling the heart of David. I love David's response. He says to Michael, it was before the Lord. Do you forget whose presence we're in? Do you understand that Yahweh is here and it is before him that I'm worshiping? I'm not worshiping so that I look good. I'm not worshiping so that you delight in how spiritual I am. I'm worshiping because I'm lost in the greatness of my God. Don't you long to worship that way, Anthem? Like, not fearful that people will think that you look weird or that you sound bad or that your arms aren't raised high enough or that you're dancing like a fool or that you're falling on your knees so clearly you must be a sinner. But aren't you just excited to worship with abandon our Lord? This is what David had found that day. And furthermore, he says, it is this God who chose me instead of your dad and your household. He appointed me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. David's delineating clearly here, dividing rightly. Like, you guys are, you're so concerned about this present life. You're concerned about what you have and who you are and what your image is. I care nothing for that. I am worshiping God. And it's for this very reason that God has made me king, because you had nothing to do with God, and my heart is all for God. Therefore, I'm going to play some more music to the Lord. I will be even more undignified than this. And I tell you what, I'm going to be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you've spoken, the ones that you thought would deride me and dishonor me, I will be honored in their sight. Because when people see an honest-to-God worshiper, they're drawn towards it. It is magnetic when we become alive with the light of Jesus Christ. As we begin to worship unashamed and uninhibited, man, people recognize the difference that you're not worried about your facade, that you're actually more alive on the inside than you are on the out, that you understand that your identity isn't linked to your performance in this world, but your, your citizenship lies far beyond the reaches of this physical world. And when people recognize true worshipers, they want to know why, and they want to know who you're worshiping, and they're drawn towards that, and they want to participate in that true and honest worship. Therefore, the daughter of Saul had no children to the day of her death. You know, whether that's like this divine judgment that God just closed her womb, my thought is David just didn't want to have anything to do with her, much less be romantic with this woman. And so she remained childless, and she did not perpetuate the sinful, false, pretentious act of just looking good and being dead inside. So as I invite the worship team back up here, Anthem, I want you just to take a moment and think, how are you approaching God? Are you this young David who's flippant, an arrogant, uninformed. Yeah, you might be emotionally invested. You might even be sincere, but you're wrong. God has given us such a blessing in his word that we may be informed who God is, how we can live lives that please him. The way being saved through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord is, is all found in here. And furthermore, it says that, that no other way on earth is correct for us to be saved. Are you humbling yourself to what God has shared with you already? Do you find yourself like Uzzah? Like, oh, I've been around this stuff all my life. I can quote you memory verses till the sun goes down. My parents were in ministry. I went to Bible college. I'm a pro, okay? Like, I'm an asset to God. If you approach God on your own terms with arrogance, I promise you, in more reality than Uzzah experienced, you will experience death and judgment from our Lord. But, as David throughout his entire life shows us, even if you're a screw-up, if you will continue to humble yourself, to repent, to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, man, there is a Lord who dwells on a mercy seat. And you can approach that God on his terms with his worship and find a merciful Lord who loves you and who longs for relationship. Or you can just fight for a facade 
and you will experience a God of righteousness and wrath for your sin, and you will well deserve what he gives you. And perhaps there's some today like Michael who just aren't a part of it, and it looks silly, and it looks odd, and it has nothing to do with what the world says is correct or meaningful, and it just looks like a bunch of foolishness. It is. And man, we invite you to be a fool for Christ with us. Like, be set apart, be saved, find a true identity that goes beyond what you have and what you do. Like, find a joy that goes beyond if your life temporarily happens to be okay. That there is so much more locked up when we begin to worship our Lord as He intends for us. Man, may we be God worshipers and some day in and day out. Let's pray. Lord, I so freely confess how good I am at messing this up. How easy it is to want to look good, to perform well, and, uh, and just fake it. Because, man, that's safer, quicker, easier. Please forgive me, Lord, for how often I have just wreaked havoc upon my life of worship to you. Lord, we as an assembled body, we come before you and we freely admit we are sinners. We need your grace. We live on your love and forgiveness. And may it never cease, Lord God. Continue to reveal within our hearts where our errors are so that we may confess, so that we may be redeemed and forgiven and set free from that sin that so easily entangles. Lord, for those here who do not know you, some of them might even think they do, but they do not. Show them, Lord, that you are deeper than our conduct, that there is more to this life than just looking good and being successful. Help them find you. Help them find true life. Help them to recognize the ugliness of their sin and to confess and to repent and to receive your forgiveness today. We love you, Lord.